If y'all would, open your book to page 525. We're going to talk about viruses today, and hopefully we can finish fast enough. We'll do a little uh, little bacterial uh, growth. Oh, that video shows hilarious. Like that? Like, enable law? I don't think so. And I was cheering for them. Bro, what Some of y'all probably said enable law, but we're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, that page. Help Drew out. What page is this? Five, You go to the hospital. You should go to the hospital. Put the camera on me. What? Huh? No. No. Okay. So. What is that? Now, yesterday we talked about. Bro, why is your head sideways? Go back. <laughs> Listen, okay, my turn. Meredith, up here. Drew, quiet, please. Trying to help her out, bro. Um, we're talking about viruses today, and a virus is a uh, is basically a uh, piece of material. Scientists don't consider viruses to be alive because they're not cells. And they don't move on their own, and they don't respond. They don't grow and get bigger. They don't. Uh, they can't reproduce except um, inside of a cell. So they're kind of like parasites. Um, but they can cause sicknesses and all sorts of problems. How are they not living if they can have sex? Well, they don't have sex. Which ones are the ones that do? Those are bacteria. You learned about that oh, yesterday. Yeah, These yeah, are viruses. Uh, viruses are much smaller than bacteria. You can fit a thousand back viruses in some bacteria. So here's what a virus is made of. It's got protein on the outside, and it's got some DNA, either DNA or RNA, on the inside. And they're very small, and, and the DNA is instructions for making more viruses. So what these things will do is, is work their way into a cell, and, and the cell will read the DNA of the virus and make more viruses. And then the viruses will come bursting out of the cell. And it will kill the cell when it does that. This is a type of virus called a T4 virus. And if you ever see the word phage, phage means virus, and it's usually used to mean a virus that infects bacteria. Some bacteria get infected with viruses, and we call those viruses that infect bacteria phages. Yes? Can I bring hey. my Yes, go get your binder. Yeah. Try and bring everything to class with you today. This is a virus called the tobacco mosaic virus. It's shaped like a rod. And what it does is it causes spots to occur on tobacco leaves. Now, it doesn't infect humans, so uh, it, it can't hurt humans. The virus cannot get in humans. If you had smoked a cigarette that had tobacco mosaic virus in the, in the leaves of the tobacco, it wouldn't hurt you. But it, it, it hurts tobacco plants and causes them not to grow as well, and it costs tobacco farmers a lot of money every year. This is a stupid video oh, yes. about yes. viruses. Oh, my name. He doesn't want to. Oh! Oh! I'm very sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the clumsy one. I'm sorry. Are you all right? Oh, well, yeah. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, I'm feeling fairly alive. Hey, you're a virus, aren't you? Sure, I'm a virus. But I hate to tell you, but most biologists don't consider us viruses alive. Oh, no wonder I'm feeling so alive. No wonder. By the way, may I introduce myself? I'm virus T4, but you can call me T4. Charmed, I am sure. I'm a tobacco mosaic virus, and you can call me Mo. Oh, I tried to stay away from that tobacco stuff, yeah. you know. Hey, by the way, what do you, what do you call that 
light shape. Oh, cylindrical. I notice you have a polyhedral head. Yes, I do, and I'm proud of it, Mo. Uh, hey, uh, would you be interested in getting together later and, uh, you know, infect the same host? Oh, that's very nice, Hugh, but I, I don't think so. Maybe some other time. I'm, I'm, I'm a little under the Come weather here. All right. All right. All right, sure, sure. Some other time, some other time. Well, you seem like a very nice virus. It's, it's nice to meet you, Mom. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I'm sure. That was fun. That was only moderately stupid. Yeah, that was pretty decent. I kind of like it. I like them. That's the Ebola virus. That's a virus that causes a, a disease that I'm going to show you a video, video of in just a minute. But it's, it's found in Africa, and it comes out uh, of the rainforest, and we don't know what carries it. Some animal, maybe a bat or, or some kind of rodent or, or a monkey or something. And uh, sometimes it jumps into a human population, and it kills 80% of the people it infects within two weeks. It's a very scary virus. What's it called? It's, it's called Ebola. And it's passed along from human to human very quickly, and usually... People uh, who are infected are in little these little villages in the middle of Africa, and they don't travel around, so it kind of works its way through the village, and most people die, and a few survive, and then that's the end of it. And so about every 20 years, you get this outbreak of this Ebola virus. If you've ever seen the movie Outbreak uh, with Dustin Hoffman and Morgan Freeman, it was a Morgan fictional Freeman movie about this virus is jumping into the human population and possibly spreading uh, what would happen if somehow it spread to America. And that was a that was a good movie if you ever want to watch that. What's it called? Outbreak. It's a good movie. Now, <clears throat> the virus, here's the way a virus works. We have, it has two cycles. One's called the Leydig cycle. Stop talking. One's called the lysogenic cycle. And let me show you how, how this works. This is your essay. If you get this chapter, you have to write about this. And so what happens is, here's a, here are viruses. These little things are viruses. And the virus will attach to a cell. And this happens to be, this is showing viruses that infect bacterial cells. But the same thing can happen in your body. A virus can infect a cell, say, in the back of your throat. And the virus attaches to the cell. That's called attachment. Here the virus attaches to a bacterial cell. And there's the virus which is with its capsid. The capsid is the outer covering of the virus. And its nucleic acid, that's the DNA or RNA of the virus. That's the instructions for making new viruses. And so first attachment happens, the virus attaches to the cell, and then entry. The virus injects its DNA into the cell. So that little DNA strand is now in the cell. And the cell is kind of stupid, it'll read any DNA that's in there. All cells will, they don't have a way of discerning. And so they'll read the DNA that got injected, and that DNA says what? What's, what's on the viral DNA? What is the code for? How to make a virus. How to make a virus. And so the cell will read that DNA and will make more viruses. And those are the virus pieces. So we call that replication. The bacterial cell makes more viral DNA and proteins. There it is. And then it puts all those viral DNA and proteins together. That's called the assembly phase. It puts them all together. And then release is when the viruses break out of the cell. And that kills the cell. And one cell can release up to a hundred, uh, even a thousand viruses. And each virus can go infect another cell. And the cycle starts all over. And this is exactly what happens when you get sick from a virus. Let's say you're drinking after someone in the lunchroom that has a cold. The, one of their viruses is on the can, or in the, in, the, in the soda that you're drinking. And one of those viruses gets in the back of your throat, attaches to a cell, invades, sticks its DNA into your cell. Pretty soon your cell bursts open and releases a hundred or a thousand new viruses in each of those viruses and goes and invades another cell. 
the whole cycle takes several hours, so maybe a day later you've, you have a thousand cells bursting open releasing viruses. And all that dead cell material runs down your throat and it, it, it makes it itch and <coughs> you start coughing because <coughs> all that dead virus stuff running down your throat. And then your, your brain becomes aware because all of this dead material makes chemicals that run through your blood and it goes to your brain and your brain senses, oh my gosh, we've got a virus invasion. And your brain kicks in all these chemicals that make you feel bad. And so you go, oh, I don't feel so good. And what's the purpose of that? It's so you'll lay down. And all of your energy can go to fighting the virus instead of running around doing your normal stuff. That's why you feel bad when you get sick. So then you lay down, and all your energy goes to making new white blood cells that will go up and fight the virus. It takes a few weeks, but the white blood cells will eventually eat up all the viruses. So you if you stay in your bed for a, for a week, your cold will go away. Well, some people, if your immune system is not good enough, you'll never defeat the virus. Enough of your cells die, you die. So a lot of people, usually old people, get sick. Don't get better, and that's that might be how you go. Now, there's a there's an even more uh, an uh, even more different phase that can infect cells. It's kind of insidious because it can sit a virus can sit dormant inside a cell for for many many weeks, months, or even years. Tucker, don't put your head down. It's very rude. Thank you. And here's how this works. We call it the lysogenic cycle. A virus attaches, injects its DNA, and instead of the virus immediately making, the cell immediately making more viruses, instead of that, the viral DNA ties itself into the host cell DNA. It forms a little loop there. See, that's the viral DNA, and that's the regular cell's DNA. And now the viral DNA is in with the regular cell's DNA, and this cell goes on living its life as normal. It doesn't even realize it's been infected. And you know what that cell will do at some point? It'll multiply. And one cell will turn into two cells. And each time it multiplies, it also copies the, the viral DNA. And by the way, we call that viral DNA a provirus. A provirus is the bit of viral DNA that sits inside the host cell chromosome. And so this cell can copy itself hundreds of times. You can go from one cell that's infected with a viral DNA to two cells, then four cells. 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. Yes. Pretty going. soon hundreds Keep of going. your cells, this could happen in your mouth, hundreds of your cells have little viral DNA inside their chromosomes. But the cells don't, you don't know it. And you don't realize that you've been infected until at some point, which differs for each type of virus, but at some point, sometimes when the weather changes, or when you're hit with ultraviolet radiation from the sun, or a number of other things, the provirus will jump out and leave the bacterial chromosome or the cell's chromosome, which it does here, and then the cell will read those instructions and make more viruses. And so, if you have this lysogenic cycle virus, you have viral cells, you have cells that have been infected with a virus that lay dormant for a long period of time. Have you ever heard of herpes? Herpes is a virus that does that. And so people, if you ever catch herpes, you have it for the rest of your life. And every, every so often you'll have what's called an outbreak uh, where the, uh, where this viruses just start multiplying in some of the cells and then it'll be dormant for a while and it'll clear up and you'll be fine and then you'll have another outbreak. So, um, uh, cold sores, have you ever heard of cold sore? Some people could get cold sores. That, that's the herpes virus. That's a form of, and if you have that you'll have it the rest of your life. Is it true that like 80% of Americans have herpes? That could be true because a lot of people get cold sores. If you drink after somebody who get who has cold sores while they have a cold sore, you can get some of those viruses in you, and then you'll have cold sores forever. Yes. Cold sores? Do you have a, a, a form of herpes? Yes. 
called herpes simplex A. Now, that's different than the genital herpes. It does, the cold sores are outbreaks of virus in your mouth. Genital herpes are outbreaks of virus in your private parts. Neither of them are very comfortable, I'm sure. Did I just call it genital herpes because it's on your genitals? Yes. If it's on your genitals, they call it um, genital herpes. Okay. Yes. Video footage of the lytic cycle. This is the whole time. That's pretty much, yeah. The lytic cycle is a viral reproductive Listen. cycle in which a virus... This is half of your essay. This is the lytic cycle. I bet he says 125 words here. At least. The lytic cycle is a viral reproductive cycle in which a virus takes over all metabolic the activities video, no of account. a cell, replicates itself many times, then destroys the host cell. Watch it. A bacterial phage attaches to a bacterial host cell by recognizing and locking onto a specific receptor site on the surface of the host cell. The virus then injects its DNA into the host cell. The empty coat remains outside the cell. Inside the cell, the viral DNA breaks down the host cell's DNA. The virus then takes over the total metabolic activities of the host cell. By using the raw materials present in the cell, the viral DNA directs the production of new virus parts. The newly produced viral components are assembled into complete new virus particles. The host cell bursts open and releases 100 to 200 new virus particles. These new particles can begin another cycle by infecting nearby cells. Huh. See how that works? That was a good video, bro. Now watch the lysogenic cycle a little bit different here. So this will be the second half of your essay writing about the lysogenic cycle. In a lysogenic cycle, viral nucleic acid becomes part of the host cell's chromosome and is replicated with it. Eventually, the virus enters a lytic cycle and kills the host cells. A bacterial phage attaches to a bacterial host cell by locking onto a specific receptor site on the surface of the host cell. The virus then injects its DNA into the host cell. Once inside the cell, the viral DNA inserts itself into a specific site in the chromosome of the host cell. The viral DNA is then called a provirus. Got to put that in your essay. During pro cell reproduction, the host cell copies the provirus genes along with its own DNA. The provirus is inactive at this time. When the cell divides, both the host genes and the provirus genes are passed on to the two daughter cells. At any time, a provirus may leave the host chromosome and enter a lytic cycle. When this happens, the host cell's DNA is broken down and new virus parts are produced and assembled. Eventually, the cell ruptures and new virus particles are released. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was, was it? Okay. Bro, it's No, I can't answer. Why not? Now, this is a video of the Ebola virus, and it's kind of scary, um, but it shows how one of these viruses can kind of decimate a population rather quickly. So, scary video, pay attention. It's only about eight minutes. <laughs> a terrifying virus visited grief upon the town of Kikwik in Zaire, Africa. Victims died within days. Sucker. Entire families were wiped out. The killer was a deadly strain of Ebola. The virus so destructive, even the corpses are infectious. Anyone who gets near them must be doused in purging chemicals. As the people of Kikwit brought out their dead, a watching world recoiled in horror. The town was quarantined to prevent Ebola from spreading to Zaire's capital, Kinshasa. 
from there, the deadly virus could have hitched a plane ride to anywhere in the world. The outbreak began with patients arriving at this primitive town hospital, complaining of headaches, fever, nausea, symptoms of any number of common tropical ailments. Soon they were disgorging black vomit and diarrhea dark with blood. Something was eating their insides. The bewildered doctors didn't suspect what was in store. Protective uniforms arrived within a few days, but it was too late. Several doctors and nurses had contracted the deadly disease. Disaster had struck. The skin of Ebola patients becomes discolored as the virus consumes the tissue beneath. The flesh begins to tear spontaneously, and blood, hot with viral debris, hemorrhages forth unstoppably. Doctors call this bleeding out. Ebola attacks every organ in the human body, the brain, liver, kidneys. The muscles in the face freeze into a mask. There is no cure for Ebola. Eight of every ten victims die. As death approaches, the eyes roll up in the head from shock. The liquefying cadaver sheds rivers of hotly contagious virus particles. One Ebola particle can infect and kill its victim in less than ten days. Medical workers protect themselves with layers of slick plastic, goggles, and boots to keep it out, and that still may not be enough. One nurse caught Ebola even through her protective suit. Viruses are one of man's most powerful predators. They come in different shapes and from different sources, but they're all alike. They're all parasites. Bits of genetic material, neither alive nor dead, that wait to latch onto a living cell. The thread like Ebola, like all viruses, hijacks the cell's machinery and uses it to make more copies of itself. Copies of the virus break free to replicate again and again in other cells. That's the horror of Ebola. As the virus multiplies, the body fails. Ebola struck 296 people. Only 63 survived. Hey, what Nurse Melanie Mbouyi is one of the lucky few. I was frightened, watching my colleagues dying like that, like pigs. I was truly terrified, but as I too got sick, the suffering became so great I lost my fear. I stopped caring about anything, even about dying. In fact, I wanted to die, just to die, rather than go on suffering like that. As the highly contagious virus spread, some hospital workers fled in terror. Nurse Rafael Nicolo stayed. He contracted the disease just by closing the eyes of his colleagues. When you're vomiting blood, bleeding from your eyes, and every other orifice, no one wants to come near you. So we lay there, abandoned and despairing. Then, mercifully, medical help arrived with the right protective gear. Says Nicolo, it was like a miracle from God. Only a few organizations in the world are equipped to handle a deadly virus like Ebola. Experts call the infected area a hot zone. The virus troops are in constant training to respond to rare threats like Ebola. They've developed an isolation stretcher to keep the killer virus from spreading from the victim inside to others. The officers of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases are hot zone experts. USAMRIN task forces drop into infected areas equipped with antiviral spacesuits, each with its own filtered air supply. The USAMRIN team was more than ready for Kikwit's call for help. They had seen Ebola before in two outbreaks in Africa in 1976. But more alarmingly, it had been right in their own backyard much more recently. Reston, Virginia is 15 miles from Washington, D.C. and 30 miles from USAMRIN's home in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Ebola came here in disguise jumping from one of the poorest areas of the globe to one of the richest. 
it landed right next to this playground. Reston used to be home to a quarantine center for imported monkeys, like these macaques. The monkeys would spend a month in Reston, awaiting shipment to buyers all over the country. In the fall of 1989, dozens of the Reston monkeys suddenly began to hemorrhage and die. Usamra received blood and tissue samples from the dead animals for testing. What the experts saw terrified them. In the microscope, they saw the telltale strands of the killer Ebola virus. All the known agents of that family were very lethal for men, and here it was in the United States. General Phil Russell was commander of U.S. Army Medical Research at the time. So we had an organism, a new virus uh, that presumably uh, it was, it was like its cousins and uh, in the United States and killing monkeys. And uh, so the public health uh, um, um, dangers were very obvious. But it was even worse than they feared. Monkeys throughout the facility began to die. That meant that this strain of the Ebola virus was airborne, unlike its cousin in Africa. If human workers breathed deadly virus particles, they might contract it. And from there, Ebola could spread throughout the entire Washington area. The army went into action. They quietly destroyed 500 monkeys and drenched the building with chemicals to kill any remaining virus inside. Eventually, the entire structure was leveled. The monkey handlers never got sick. Researchers studying the virus discovered that this strain of Ebola doesn't affect people, only monkeys. No one knows why this strain is so different from the killer strain. I think we can make a good case for that we ducked a, a bullet that we were very, very lucky in. But a killer still lurks in the jungles of Zaire. Finding it is the challenge. Because if they developed an airborne strain that was infectious to humans, it could have killed every person in, in the world. It's scary. That's what that movie's about, Outbreak. Don't eat. the whole facility. Yeah. Probably a load of people doing it. Nuclear metal or something. Okay, let me show you some virus diseases. Didn't we see these yesterday? Yeah, we saw these yesterday, bro. I showed you, uh. What? I showed you bacterial diseases here, or viral diseases. Yeah. Here's the plan. We get the warhead and we hold the world ransom for one million dollars. <laughs> That's it. Uh, measles? You ever heard of measles? Oh yeah. And That's a viral that. disease. Smallpox. Smallpox, the book talks about, this was a viral disorder that was actually eliminated from the face of the planet by scientists. Wow. who went around to every person and gave them a vaccine. And since this virus only lives in people, not in animals, that stopped the transmission. That's pretty cool. That's good Millions of people died of, of smallpox over the years. Now nobody dies from What's it. What's a monkeypox? Monkeypox is like smallpox, but it's carried by monkeys, so you can't get rid of it. Bro, what else are these awards? Those are, those oh, are, uh, got a tumor? Viral diseases too. That's a tumor of the jaw <coughs> formed by a virus <coughs> called Burkitt's lymphoma. Let's see the herpes in the ward. Shingles results from the varicella zoster virus infection acquired during childhood exposure to chicken pox. The virus can remain latent within the body for years before becoming active. You may have heard of shingles before. You can get rid of shingles, don't you? No, you got shingles. Yeah. Molluscum, no, it lasts for life. Tumor-like growths that develop in cases of molluscum contagiosum, which is caused by a virus. Mumps. See the swollen area of his chin? Those are swollen lymph nodes. He's got the mumps. Smallpox video. Vaccines have so far been our ultimate weapon in the war against diseases. 
the first vaccine ever invented brought science its only total victory over a microbe. It was a particularly vicious disease that provided our singular triumph. Smallpox. Epidemics down the centuries regularly killed millions of people. A smallpox virus called variola attacks the whole body, blistering the skin, invading the intestines, and killing one in three sufferers. Survivors bear the scars for life. But smallpox had a fatal weakness. The virus lives only in humans. It has no animal or insect host. When we attacked it with a vaccine, it had nowhere else to hide. In the 1960s, the World Health Organization launched a global campaign to wipe it from the face of the earth. In the 50s and 60s, teams of people, volunteers, college students, medical students, in the United States, in England, in Europe, in India, in Africa, went all over the world. And the last natural case of infection of smallpox was October 26, 1977. This Somalian peasant was the last known case. Within a decade, science had won. That's a pretty spectacular scientific achievement. I think it's the, probably the greatest public health achievement that's ever happened. The last surviving specimens of the smallpox virus are locked away in vaults in the United States and Russia. It's a species on death row scheduled for extermination. Yet mankind stays its hand, debating if the sentence should be carried out. <laughs> Arthur Kaplan is a bioethicist. There is a case for preserving smallpox virus someplace on this globe. The case for it is this. First, don't be arrogant. What you think you understand you may not, if you eliminate a creature, you never know it may turn out to be something that has Oddly enough, surprisingly enough, some value. Smallpox is defeated, yet not fully understood. But other scientists ask, why should we save these dangerous specimens? Is it worth keeping them around if there is no further transmission? Let's abolish them once and for all from the face of the earth. The existence of the variola virus in those two freezers still presents a threat Terrorists, craziness, accidents, earthquake could cause big trouble. After weighing the arguments, the death sentence has been postponed. At some point, I think we're going to destroy it because we fear it so much. And we can't really bring ourselves to think that anything good could come from something that's caused so much misery. Science has since taken aim at other ancient diseases, but the victory over smallpox has yet to be repeated. Some diseases are more stubborn opponents. Smallpox is what Cortez brought over and killed almost all the Aztecs. I don't know if you ever studied about that in history. Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of a famous, uh, famous disease that just doesn't exist anymore. Have they, have they We're lucky we lived in this time. Have they destroyed it? Nope. The problem with destroying it is this. If it ever came back about somehow, like... Maybe, maybe there is something carrying it somewhere in the woods that we don't know about. We might need those viruses to make new vaccines. So if you get rid of them, wouldn't that be terrible if somebody had it somewhere and, and then we couldn't make the vaccines quickly because we had get, we'd gotten rid of the organisms. So they keep them around. Did, did Russia Where do they keep them? No, Russia still has theirs too. All Russia Where do you keep them? They keep them at the CDC in Atlanta. In Atlanta. 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 Russia's got them in Moscow. Peace out. Thank you.